This video is brought to you by Epic Loot Jewelry. Get unique pieces inspired by Norse culture at epiclootshop.com. Link is in this video's description. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and I hope you're ready for another episode of Messed Up Minute that, to no one's surprise, is longer than a minute. Today I want to talk to you about what I find to be one of the more interesting parts of Norse mythology, the nine worlds that are held in the branches and roots of Yggdrasil, the world tree. Now you might be wondering, John, hold up, the Vikings really believe there were nine different worlds? What are these worlds? Where were they in relation to our own? Were they also populated by Vikings or did other species live there? At least I hope that's what you're wondering because those are the questions we're going to be answering today in addition to clarifying some common misconceptions about these worlds and various Viking beliefs. So let's start with your first hypothetical question. What are these nine worlds? Well, like most things in Norse mythology, we're never given an orderly list that names and describes them because the majority of the culture was passed on orally. But there are multiple references to their existence in the poems found in the Poetic Edda and stories found in Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda. As a result, experts have been able to make a speculative list that goes as follows. Asgard, Jotunheim, Midgard, Muspelheim, Niflheim, Vanaheim, Alfheim, Nidavellir slash Svartalfheim, and last but not least, Hell. You have no idea how hard it was to not sing that list like the Fairly Odd Parents intro. When it comes to where these worlds are located, we're told in the old text they're connected to various roots and branches of Yggdrasil, but that's literally all we know. Any map you've seen, including the one I'm showing you now, is purely concept art and nothing more. That being said, we can be sure the Vikings believed that some worlds overlapped with our own, like Asgard and Jotunheim, in part due to a concept called Inangard and Utangard, roughly translated to to inside the fence and outside the fence. According to Norse expert Daniel McCoy, whose book The Viking Spirit I use for a lot of my research on the mythos, this concept comes from agrarian land use practices where the fence on a farmer's property separated pastures and fields of crops from the wilderness beyond them. So if something is in Ingard, it is civilized, law-abiding, and orderly, while things that are out in guard are wild and chaotic, with the guard suffix implying there's some kind of wall or barrier on the other side of which lies the chaos. As an example of Inangard, let's take a look at Asgard, the world of the Aesir gods that resided in the skies above. Unfortunately, the city of solid gold that's portrayed in the Marvel movies is not described anywhere in the texts, but the extreme orderliness and civilized behavior of its residents is true to the sources. Asgard was fortified with a massive wall that was built to about 95% completion by a giant, a story we'll talk about some other time, and also contained several palaces and territories that were owned and operated by the Aesir gods like Valhalla or the Bifrost, which of course is the rainbow bridge the gods use to travel to Midgard. Speaking of, the only other world that has that guard suffix is Midgard, the home of the humans, which I hope you're somewhat familiar with. As we learned in my episode about the creation myth, the world itself was made from the corpse of Amir, the first giant, but Midgard specifically was made from Amir's eyebrows. These served as a barrier of protection against threats from other more chaotic worlds like Jotunheim, which epitomizes the concept of Ut Guard perfectly. In the Eddas, it's described as having deep, dark forests, vast, watery landscapes, mountain peaks with endless winters, and other conditions that mere mortals like us would find inhospitable and dangerous. To put it another way, Jotunheim contains all of those scary things that lie on the outside of the fence. In fact, when the Germanic peoples looked up at the mountains or stared at those deep, dark forests that were filled with all kinds of dangerous beasts, they sometimes thought they were actually looking at Jotunheim itself. In this this is why Midgard was given its name, which can be roughly translated to Middle Enclosure. It was basically a world that was naturally chaotic, but strived to be orderly like Asgard, using both physical and metaphysical boundaries like fences, laws, and social customs to keep the more wild aspects at a distance. But now let's move on to some of those chaotic other worlds, shall we? That is why we're here after all. Muspelheim and Niflheim are two more that you should be familiar with if you've seen my video on the Norse creation story. Described as the primordial worlds of fire and ice respectively, it was the heat from Muspelheim that caused the ice from Niflheim to melt and drip into the Ganungagap, where a new mass of ice would form and the world as we know it would slowly start to take shape. Fast forward to the end of the world though, when Muspelheim comes into play once again when the fire giant known as Surtur shows up to slay the gods with his flaming sword and burn anything that's left. As for Niflheim, outside of it being one big icicle, we also know it has a spring called Virgilmir that's filled to the brim with snakes and the dragon Nidhogg, which is known for chewing 
arguing at the roots of the world tree. Several rivers are also said to flow from this spring, some of which are venomous. In fact, one of those rivers' venom spilling over onto the mass of ice in the Ganungagap is what led to the creation of Amir the Giant. Next, we have Vanaheim, the homeland of the Vanir gods. Unlike the Aesir, who were heavily associated with honor, loyalty, and obedience to the laws, the Vanir were a more magic-oriented race that was associated with fertility and nature. The world they inhabit is never described in any of the ancient texts, but when you consider the kinds of gods they were, and the fact that Vanaheim doesn't end in the special guard suffix, you can confidently assume their world is a bit more wild and natural as opposed to orderly and cultural like the Aesir's or even humans. The next world that we're kind of assuming is one of the core nine is called Alfheim, and as the name suggests, is the home of Alf. Or I'm sorry, that's Elf. Elves live there. Similar to Vanaheim, there are no direct descriptions of Alfheim, but the elves themselves are said to be luminous and more beautiful than the sun, a fact that the God of War developers apparently decided to ignore. Because of that, though, we can assume that their homeland was a gracious realm of light and beauty. Personally, I picture it like Rivendell from Lord of the Rings. Also, for reasons the experts still haven't figured out, the Vanir god Freyr, Freya's brother, is the ruler of Alfheim. Thought I'd throw that out there. But now that I mentioned the home of the elves, we gotta talk about where the dwarves live, which just so happens to be the only realm whose name I constantly forget. Though in my defense, it's the only realm that's referred to by two different names, Nidavellir and Svartalfheim. Experts believe that Nidavellir, which means low dark fields, was the original name for the realm, as the poem that uses it, Volushpa, is much older than the prose Edda, the only source that calls it Svartalfheim. Weirdly enough, Svartalfheim can be translated to mean homeland of the black elves, a name that is exclusively used by Snorri to describe dwarves. We have no idea why, but I assume it's a byproduct of them being renowned blacksmiths or literally being covered in black soot from working with coals, fire, and metals all day and living underground. Once again, we're never given a description of their world, but due to the nature of dwarves and their reputation as blacksmiths, their home was probably thought of as an underground labyrinth filled with mines and forges where they could easily access the materials for their craft. And the last, but certainly not least of the nine worlds is Hell. Sometimes referred to as Helheim in the secondhand sources, this was the land of the dead that was ruled over by the goddess Hell, Loki's daughter. Because dead bodies were buried underground, Hell was believed to be underground as well, and some sources mention a dog similar to Cerberus guarding its entrance. Now you'll hear from popular media, and maybe even me from time to time, that hell was filled with those who died in noble deaths, from things like old age or sickness, but the only source that makes this distinction is once again, Snorri's prose Edda. He's also the only one who describes hell as an unpleasant place, a frozen landscape that's impossibly cold, but experts think this was him trying to harmonize Norse beliefs with Christianity. That's because there are older sources that refer to it in neutral or even positive terms where the dead are able to live on in some capacity and engage in the same activities they did in life like eating, drinking, and fighting. It wasn't supposed to be a place of eternal bliss or torment, but simply a continuation of life somewhere else. In other words, if the original Norse beliefs were in fact correct, you probably don't have to worry about being tortured for eternity just because you didn't die in battle in the name of Odin. You may not go to Valhalla, but ask yourself, did you really want to spend centuries training for a battle that's destined to end in destruction for all parties involved anyway? Seems kind of pointless if you ask me. With that, though, comes the end of another episode of Mythology Explained. Thank you all for watching and learning some cool new shit alongside me. If you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel, make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons to get more content like this delivered to your sub box and recommended feed. Those who want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news would be wise to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, with YouTube being so unreliable with their subscriptions and notifications, it wouldn't hurt to have a backup way of being notified whenever I upload. I'll see you all again next Thursday with another episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.